traducción de idiomas de la Facultad de Humanidad en Cusar, embajada de los Estados Unidos en Guatemala. Asociación de Jóvenes Secretarios del Departamento de Estado de My name is Jocelyn Lopez, and I will be hosting this conference. Thank you so much for joining us. Before we start, there are some general instructions for you to follow. One, we will have 10 minutes for questions and answers. And at the end of this conference, I will be reading the questions and comments you post directly in the live chat. Two, do not forget to subscribe to both of our channels, Idioma Susar, CTS conferences, and so and you can stay tuned on all of these conferences. So in this case, at five, in all the posts that the Tunde Idiomas will give. Okay? Thank you again for joining to this conference. Teaching English pronunciation, in charge of the Benedictine, who we warmly welcome in name of the Organizing Commission TPS 2020. Now, I am going to read a little bit about the Benedictine, born in the race in Mexico, then Savannah finds herself somewhere she, she never was free. After studying and working as an architect, she found herself on fulfilling work and started teaching English to Latin immigrants in her community. It was there that she found her passion. After receiving the service one term as an English teaching assistant with a Fulbright grant, she decided to stay and start helping the development of the U.S. Embassy English Language Program, ELP, in Chichen. Savannah loves her job, her students, and the teachers that make up the national ELP team. She loves spending time with her cat, planning her December wedding, and is currently working towards her master's in inclusive and intercultural education. So, Savannah, time is all yours. Thank you so much, Jocelyn. Um, I hope everyone is doing well this afternoon. I hope that everyone has really enjoyed and taken advantage of this really awesome um, opportunity for all of you to learn from different English teachers and uh, different English, um, I don't want to say experts because I'm definitely not an expert, but um, other English experts from all over the country. And um, so I'm really excited to be here today to talk to you about something that I think is really fun and um, really exciting, which is English pronunciation. So um, as you can tell, I am a native English speaker and I grew up in the United States, but I studied linguistics through my, I have a double major um, from college, so from university in um, Spanish and in architecture. So I was able to explore linguistics through Spanish and it was a really amazing experience because I felt like I could finally talk to um, the different problems that students have with pronunciation, the different problems that English speakers have with Spanish pronunciation. And so um, I'm really excited to get to share with you some of the information that I've gathered throughout the last couple of years and how to share that with all of you. So let's get going. So the first step in really teaching great pronunciation is to start with warm-ups. So I don't know how many of you play sports or are otherwise engaged in athletic activities. I am not. Um, <laughs> but in order to be a really good athlete, you have to warm up before you go and do something physically exhausting. And the thing is that pronunciation is physical. It's a physical event where you are using the I think it's 43 muscles that are in your face and the muscles in your chest and in your shoulders and in your neck 
to really be able to pronounce things well. What's difficult is that we're working with two very different languages, and we're going to spend a lot of time today going through the differences between them. But um, we're going to talk a lot about why is speaking and pronouncing English perfectly difficult for Spanish speakers. And if you're a Spanish, a native Spanish speaker who's teaching English, it can be even more difficult because you want your students to hear and learn how to pronounce sounds correctly, but you feel as a teacher that you don't have that strength. So let's dive in. So with warm-ups, I have a lot of different warm-up techniques and I'm going to look ridiculous doing these by myself in my office at my house, but um, these are really, really fun ways to physically warm up all of the muscles in your face. So the first thing we have is typically I'll tell, I usually have a very interactive workshop with this particular workshop, but obviously we're a little, uh, the times are different. <laughs> so I usually tell my students to stand up straight, to roll their shoulders, put their shoulders back and down. Neck rolls are really good to kind of warm up these muscles here in your neck, which do actually help you produce different sounds. Jaw massages, so allowing your students to just drop the jaw, almost like yawning. And it's also a really good opportunity for your students to start working out their voices. So if you sing or um, if you're a public speaker, you it helps to warm up your voice by like ooh, 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 making noises, changing your range. So, um, and it's really fun, especially if you work with children, working with pronunciation with children is both easier because they pick it up faster and harder because it's hard to keep them focused, right? So doing activities like this to get all of those energy feelings out can be really helpful um, for teaching with children and with adults. So wiggling, get the wiggles out because sometimes pronunciation gets very still and you're really just focusing on how you're pronouncing what you're saying. Lip trills. This is good to practice. Warms up your lips to be moving differently. And it also allows you to um, practice with your lung capacity and keeping that air moving. Rolling R's. This is um, very difficult for English speakers. Fun fact, uh, if you don't know this already, it's kind of funny um, because yeah, the, one of the first things when I moved here last year, one of the first things my students asked me was, can you roll your R's? Which tells you that a lot of people from the US probably can't. But um, <laughs> I learned when I was really little because my mom was a singer, so. So this is another good like uh, exercise to warm up the tongue muscles, to get that really warmed up and loose. And these are all techniques that you can do to increase energy and mobility in your pronunciation practice, which is really, really important. And a lot of people forget this step when they're teaching pronunciation. So why are warm-ups important? Okay, warm-ups help us to develop and stretch new muscles in order to have, in order to form the, the English words with the correct, like, physical shape of your mouth. So basically there's this thing called muscle memory. If you play an instrument, if you can type on a keyboard, you have muscle memory in your hands, right? Your hands just know how to play the instrument. They just know how to type on a keyboard. Um, the same exact thing happens with your face. When you learn a language, you are perfecting and, and um, what am I thinking of? Fixing those muscles, fixing as in like stabilizing those muscles to be there and only there. So when you learn a new language, you have to physically form those muscle connections with your brain and then the muscles and how you use them, which is really difficult, especially for adults. It's much harder for adults than for children. But um, so it is, it's something really physical that you have to really keep in uh, into account 
because like, for example, if I have to speak Spanish all day and I speak Spanish pretty well, but when I speak it all day, my jaw and mouth are like tired. Like I'm tired because I'm using muscles that I just don't use that often. So this is why English. And so the IPA stands for the International Phonetic Alphabet, which there's, uh, we're, we'll talk about that in a minute. But the IPA um, is basically a, it's a collection of symbols that represent sounds. So the important thing to remember about the IPA is that all of these sounds that exist specifically in English exist in other languages. There are sounds that do not exist in English that do exist in Spanish. And now not only are you learning and teaching new sounds, you're having to make very small changes from the sounds you already know. So let's talk about the IPA for a second. So the IPA is the International Phonetic Alphabet. And I want to add kind of a disclaimer here. The IPA was developed in the 1800s, I believe. And it was developed by primarily French, German, and English speaking uh, linguists, which means that the IPA reflects Latin based or Germanic languages. Essentially, all of the languages that are spoken by primarily white people on the planet, um, that's what the IPA was developed to help. I personally believe there are sounds that are exist in languages that are not reflected in the IPA. Um, and I think it's really important for us to understand that the foundation of the IPA was genuinely a colonialist foundation. They created it to help teachers teach colonial languages around the world. So um, I want you to keep that in your brain. It's a good tool, but I want you to understand the foundation of what it is and how and why we use it. So the IPA is <clears throat> split into consonants and vowels. And almost, I mean, if you went to kindergarten, everyone knows that there are consonants and vowels in every language. So the sounds are divided by the location of the sound in your mouth. So that red arrow is where it is. And I, so I learned this in Spanish. Um, <laughs> so I honestly don't even know how to pronounce this in English, but um, essentially it's bilabial and that's like your lips right here, all the way from your lips to your throat glottal. And it's okay if you can't see the letters very well. Um, we are going to go through every single letter and sound, so don't worry about it. These and and honestly, this is a tool. You don't. I'm not expecting you to learn this today. It takes linguists years to understand how each of these sounds works and how they work with other sounds and how they all work together. It's mainly just a way for me to show you. Um, that this exists and this is how we organize these sounds so that when we teach them, it makes a little bit more sense. Um, absolutely, I can share this presentation with all of you. At the end, you have the opportunity to fill out a uh, like Google form where you can leave me your email address and I am happy to share whatever conferences or whatever uh, presentation I have with you and resources. So um, the sounds are divided from like where they are, where they happen in your mouth from here to there. And they're also divided into the way that your vocal cord, tongue, and face create the vibrations. So essentially, sound is your vocal cords vibrate together, right? Those vibrations pass through your face, which acts as a speaker, and then it spits out sound waves. Those sound waves hit your ear and your brain translates that into um, understanding. It connects those sounds to words that you know. So all of these different ways, so plosive is just air, right? Um, nasal is something that's here, mm, mm. Something that's uh, fricative is something that create, where you're creating friction. So like, I'm creating friction by pushing that air between my tongue and my teeth. So 
Uh, and then with vowels, we have, sorry, I won't I try not to point at my screen. So um, with vowels, we have uh, like closed vowels, like e, 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 and we have open vowels like a. Ah. So that's how we differentiate. We have where it happens and how we create the sound. Okay, so we're going to go through consonants. I, every time I give this presentation, I change my mind. <laughs> I, I either say I think consonants are the hardest part of pronunciation, or then I say vowels are the hardest part. I don't know at this point uh, anymore, and I am choosing not to pick which one I think is harder, because <laughs> I think they're both really difficult going from Spanish to English. I will say it's significantly easier going from, uh, sorry, going from Spanish speaking Spanish to English is more difficult than going from English to Spanish because English has more sounds. English has more sounds and more vowels to create those sounds. So going from English that has more to Spanish that has less is actually much easier. So just know you're, you're fighting the more difficult battle when it comes to pronunciation. So with consonants, we're moving our tongue, our lips and our teeth. So again, this is kind of a small review. And uh, like I said, you can find, all you have to do is Google IPA English and this exact chart comes up. It's very easy to find uh, if you can't see the little letters or symbols. So with consonants, I like to think click, hiss, and pop. So everything about consonants in English are hard. They're literally difficult to create, but then they're also hard consonants, okay? For example, my favorite example, I give this every time. The word abogado. The word abogado is a very pretty word in Spanish. If I was pronouncing that having no knowledge of Spanish at all, I would say abogado, which sounds just terrible to my ear, but that's how we pronounce consonants in English. If you really listen and watch an English speaker, they are creating contact with every single vowel or consonant. So for example, the B that you have in Spanish is a soft B. Your lips like barely touch and then break apart. Ba, ba, ba. It's not ba. But where my lips push all the way together and then release. Same thing with g, abo, ga, ga. It's this very soft G where your vocal cords are like, Eep, and they pop back apart. Very, very soft. But then in English, I make full contact. G, right? Going, abogado. And then with D, D is the worst. Oh my goodness, because a soft D sounds like a TH to English speakers. So that's a big differentiation that uh, I choose to make with my students because I know that that is something that can create confusion. And we'll talk a little bit about error correction at the end and what I personally believe about error correction with Spanish speakers. But that is something to definitely remember that D can create confusion. So perfecting that duh sound can be really, that's one of the vowel or one of the consonants that I think is really important. Because in Spanish, it's the, the, and it happens like right behind your teeth. It happens like right behind them and duh, I don't even touch my teeth with my tongue. So the, the, the soft D in Spanish, your tongue is like halfway on your teeth and halfway on the roof of your mouth, the, the, and it makes kind of a TH sound, but the D in Spanish is da, da. It's hard and I don't touch my teeth. So we'll talk, I'm gonna go through all of this again, but I'm just giving you an example. So B and B, they're always hard and we differentiate them. D, almost always very strong. Z and S, this is a big, uh, this can create confusion, not a lot, but there's a difference between buzz and bus. TH and TH, we have two of them and they don't really exist in Spanish. And then CH and SH. So we'll go through these. 
So the first group of vowels that I want to talk about are the lip vowels. So this includes P as in pen and paper, and it includes B as in baby and big. So the cool thing about uh, consonants in English is that we have two types. We have vocalized, or there's another way that they say them. I've always called them vocalized. Vocalized and aspirated consonants. So vocalized consonants are consonants that you are creating sound by vibrating your vocal cords. And aspirated consonants only use air. So the best way to teach this is to tell your students to take their hand, put it on their throat, just like this. And when they start talking, they'll be able to feel the difference between when they're vocalizing a sound and when they are aspirating. So if you do this and you say paper, pen, I feel no vibration here, none. But if I say Ben or baby, buh, buh, I feel vibrations. So that tells me that the P I'm making just with air. The B I'm making with sound. This is really a, so there's a lot of reasons that I like using this technique when you're working with pronunciation. One, it's very inclusive. So if you have students that have hearing problems, if you have students that even have vision problems, being able to create a tactile connection between what they're hearing or watching and how they can actually reproduce it is super, super helpful and very inclusive of students that have different learning um, issues in the classroom. It is also a great way to include kinesthetic and tactile teaching methods in something that seems to be totally auditory. So I would very much, um, I would very much encourage you to start letting your students do this. And even if your students are comfortable with each other, doing it to their partner is, is a funny way to help them like interact. And then we have, mm. so this is still a lip sound, mm. and is this vocalized or aspirated? Mm. It's vocalized. Because if you put your hand here and you say, mm, you can feel it vibrating. So we have man and meat. So this sound is very nasal. You make the sound here. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. But the, where your face creates these sounds makes a difference. Um, so we'll talk about this more with vowels. But it's an important way to think about we move, in English, we move sounds from our throats to our noses, to our heads, to our chest. And it's kind of complicated for some students to learn that, but um, it's a fun way to think about it if it helps you. So then our next sounds are F and V. So, okay, when you teach these sounds, if you as the teacher cannot see the student's teeth, then they're probably not pronouncing it correctly. When you're going from a language like Spanish where that does not have hardly any fricative strong sounds like face or fork, because um, física, it's still a soft like fork. So a way to help students really make this sound correctly is to tell them that you need to see their teeth. And it looks ridiculous, obviously. But they'll get to the point where they can make those sounds without forcing uh, like a crazy facial movement. And then van, V. This one, you have to tell your students you need to be able to see their teeth because Spanish speaking students will by default pronounce this incorrectly. Uh, and that's fine. It doesn't matter. It's not like the end of the world. But when you are, I know that when I, because I study this and this is something that I'm passionate about, when I'm working with new students, if they can pronounce V's and Y's correctly, I automatically think um, that their level of English is higher, which isn't fair at all, but it tells me that they've worked hard to differentiate those sounds. Um, so you have to tell your students, I have to see your teeth. Van, because so my name is Savannah. 
but no one pronounces it correctly. And I could care less because it's a, it's a very American U.S. name. Um, but this is how I help my students pronounce my name correctly. Because uh, once they can get the V, then the A's are impossible. So at least they're pronouncing one sound correctly, which is the V. <laughs> so those are our first groups of consonants. So then we have our TH sounds. For this one, so with V, I said you have to be able to see your teeth, right? With TH, I need to see your tongue. So if you pronounce uh, this, that, thin, think, if I can see your tongue, if I can see my students' tongues, I know they're pronouncing this correctly. Um, and the difference between the two THs is we have hard, which is vocalized, and soft, which is aspirated. If you put your hand here, you can say, this, that, and you can feel the vibrations versus thin, think, which you can't. So uh, that's a really good way for you to differentiate and say, well, this word uses a soft TH. Put your hand here. Let's practice. Thought, thought, through. And that's, that I feel like is the most effective way to, especially with kids, to help them really adapt to that. But I mean, adults too. It's a great way to teach um, hard and soft pronunciation in English. All right, T and D. <laughs> I have, I've given this workshop like 10 times and I have tried every time to explain this differently. Essentially, you have to be able to look at a head that's cut in half. So if you pretend my head is cut in half like this, okay? And so here I have my teeth, right? And then there's like a curve and then it's like the top of your mouth, right? So the T and D sounds in both Spanish and in English occur right between the teeth and the roof of your mouth, which is uh, difficult to say the least. Because in Spanish, you say uh, todos, todos and your tongue is bent under and the tip is touching your teeth and the top is touching your mouth. Todos, todos. D is the exact same. The difference is da, 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 or da, 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 right? So in English, all you're doing is moving your tongue from here right behind your teeth to not touch your teeth. That's the only thing. If you tell your students, pronounce it like you would in Spanish, just don't touch your teeth. Also, don't touch your teeth is a great practice sentence. <laughs> I just realized that. Um, that's the best way to tell them how to, cre how to create those sounds correctly. Because the problem is in English, T and D are so specific so I don't want to show you because it's going to look ridiculous, but it's like ah, right there. Don't touch your teeth. And so those sounds in English are so specific that when you pronounce them in Spanish or like if you're speaking English and pronounce those sounds with a Spanish T or a D, it creates a lot of confusion. Um, especially because all four of these sounds, the THs, the T and the D get mixed together and create a lot of confusion. Um, Cause I, yeah, uh, dare versus there. Usually from context, I can tell what the person's talking about, but it can be, uh, it can be difficult. And it's something, so something that I really try to, we'll talk about this later again, but I try not to, honestly, I love pronunciation. I love teaching teachers how to use it. Uh, but I don't really error correct pronunciation that often with my students. I do with my teachers and with my fiance who's Guatemala and does not like it. But um, with my students, not so much. And most of it is because I know that they will not be in contact with Americans. So U.S. citizens ha are well known for criticizing English pronunciation. Even within the United States, uh, English speakers will criticize other native English speakers for their differing pronunciations because there's tons of different pronunciations and accents in the US. 
So um, it's, this is something, if my students say, if, if I want to work in the United States, if I want to go to college or university in the United States, what are the sounds I need to perfect? These are those. These and why, why? And we'll keep talking about all of those sounds. Yes, I just read a question. Is anyone else trying this as we listen? Please, please practice while we're while we're doing this. Usually when I'm doing this with everyone, uh, it, the whole workshop is loud because everyone's trying these sounds. So please, please practice. So R, this is not super hard. Um, the difference is that our R's are just harder. So like, because um, in Spanish you have two R's. You've got the rolling R like Roberto. And then you have the flipped R like pero, pero. And English has neither of those. <laughs> so our R is just er. Tell your students to put their teeth as hard as they can together and just go er. You put your teeth together and your tongue pulls back. And you pull that tongue back and it goes er. So my brother, when he was younger, he had some different speech issues. Um, due to a different, actually it's really interesting, he had an auditory processing. So when those sound waves hit his ear, his brain couldn't transmit them to meaning quickly. So um, he had issues with pronouncing some different sounds. One of those was R and now he's fine, but he's 25. But um, he could not pronounce his R's and this is how we worked with him and my whole family. We all started pronouncing our R's like this so that he would see it run, rake, uh, rain. So that's a good way to help uh, students to kind of perfect that. So then we have S, S is easy, it's the same. Swim, same. It's not uh, vocalized, aspirated, so it's a soft sound. Z is the exact same sound, I promise. It's the same sound, it's just vocalized. So what's cool about this sound is that you can practice like that. Make sure your lips itch, but that's a great way to practice and to have your students practice. And it's fun. You can do the same thing with TH. And it helps you um, to it helps you to perfect those sounds yourself as a teacher, and it helps your students make those differentiations. And then we have L and N. U is the same as in Spanish. There is an aspirated L in some Mayan languages, like uh, it's like an aspirated L kind of um, in some different, actually it's dialects within the Mayan languages. Um, so that's a good, that's an easy letter, less low. N is also easy now, name should be exactly the same as Spanish. These are kind of our harder ones. Okay, so we have sh and ch, okay? There is a big difference between shop and chop. Because if someone tells you, um, hey, let's go shopping, you're like, okay, let's go. But if someone says, let's go shopping, you might be a little concerned. Um, either they're an axe murderer or they are a chef of some kind. So the, this is a sound that you have to differentiate. Ship and chip. Uh, sheep and cheap. This is a hard one to teach though, because really the only difference is that with, so shh is a consistent shh sound. It's just a consistent air moving through. And ch is a, you're forcing that air through there. So the way that I like to teach people is add a T, like always pretend that there's a T in front of the ch sometimes there is there's a lot of words we spell with tch but even if there isn't say it like ch, like pretend there's a t and it will help you push that air out and then we have ja the ja sound okay 
This is really important. Jello and yellow are very different words. Jess and yes are very different words. So working uh, these two sounds, uh, this is my, the sound that I focus on the most. This is how I teach it. So J is how the students think Y should be pronounced. Jam, gel. It's that J, J. And, um, and I'm reading some of the comments. We'll talk about different ways as a teacher that you can practice pronunciation uh, towards the end. So don't worry, I will cover that. Um, but everything I'm doing right now, going through these sounds, that practice that do that. But I have some actual exercises later that are really fun. And um, you as a teacher can use those in class as well as practice them yourself. So I would highly recommend um, working on these sounds, the Y and the J. Your students need to be able to differentiate them. You versus Jew. Yes, there's also a web page to practice phonics that I will share with you. It's actually very cool. Um, so I would highly recommend focusing on these sounds. Then we have K and G. The biggest difference with these sounds in Spanish is that K and G are hard. You just have to make pure contact with the K and the G. So K, K, K is aspirated. You don't use your vocal cords to create the sound. Whereas G, G, like gift or game, that happens in your throat and you do create those vibrations. Then we have ng, ng. I think this technically exists linguistics. Yeah, linguistica, uh -huh. yeah, this exists in Spanish. So um, this should not be that difficult to teach. Okay, the H sound, <laughs> it's just breathing. All you do is breathe out, hand hat, handle, hot. You don't create any vibration, any friction, nothing. If your students are still pronouncing hand or hat, it makes sense why they're still pronouncing it that way. However, it's just breathing. All you do is breathe out. <laughs> So that should not be a hard one for you to teach, but it is a hard one for students to remember. They don't like to remember the H sound or the Y sound. Oh, I missed the most important tip. Okay, to teach Y, I use, uh, I tell the students, pretend there's no Y there and replace it with the letter I or H I. So I've worked with groups that have said, well, H-I makes more sense than I, and I've worked with groups that say H-I doesn't make sense, just use I. So instead of Y-E-S, yes, it's E, or I, sorry, I-E-S, yes. Instead of yellow, it's I-E-L-O, yellow. That has been the most successful way that I have taught this. The problem is students don't remember it and therefore do not apply it when they're actually speaking. But that's the best way for them to perfect that sound is to replace it with the sound they know in English. Um, oh, I have a great question here. How can I pronounce sheep and ship? So the difference there is not consonant. So we're gonna get to vowels in just a second. There you go, vowels. <laughs> so with vowels, um, you have to remember that English is a mutated, radioactive trash child of multiple different languages. So English is a combination of Latin, French, Greek, German, Norse. It's a combination of a lot of different, very strange, non-related 
languages, which make it um, kind of odd in its its uh, in its rules and in its manner. So um, <laughs> with vowels in English, you have to just grunt. You're making sounds that you would never make in Spanish because Spanish is so beautiful and all of its vowels are so pretty. Uh, in English, that is not the case. So to take to create vowels in English, you take the perfect, beautiful Spanish vowels and you just destroy them. So for example, uh, right, the key to good English vowels is imperfection. So the problem is that our students think in Spanish vowels, which makes sense. That's the scaffolding that they have. That's their context, right? The issue is that all of the English vowels are the imperfect versions of the perfect Spanish vowels. And we also have the perfect Spanish vowels. So it's very confusing. But, um, okay, so the biggest question that I receive from students is that they don't know how to pronounce the U sounds. Because in Spanish, you don't have these weird middle sounds here. You have A, E, I, O, U, right? Those are the very pure five vowels. But in Spanish, or in English, we have a, uh, a. Uh. So when I'm practicing this with students, and I learned this when I was practicing, or when I was teaching adults, and they thought this was really funny, um, put your, all you have to do is just drop your jaw, just relax it, and let your tongue die, just like flatten out in the bottom of your mouth. Uh, 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 and just practice doing that. It looks so ridiculous, um, but it is fun and it's good practice. And that's how you can practice saying those sounds. And that's how your students can practice as well. So here's the other thing. Vowels are pronounced um, in very, very small differences in our mouths. So you have to learn how to move sound around your face. And I kind of started talking about this earlier. So I grew up singing and I learned uh, when I was like a teenager that for singing, you have to produce different tones or different um, like levels of pitch, I guess, within your own sounds. So you have to learn how to talk in your chest voice, which is this more deep and robust sound. And you have to learn how to talk like a Disney princess and talk in your head voice. And you have to learn how to talk in your nose which sounds like this, and then you have to learn to talk in your head, which is normal. That is a very difficult thing to learn. Learning how to move tone from your throat to your, from your chest to your throat, to your face, to your nose, to your head is really difficult. Um, so this is why warm-ups are important. Letting your students make noise, create these weird sounds will help them when they have to change an ah sound like father to ah, like cat. So moving from ah, which is an A, to ah, which is also an A, it's good for them to be able to learn how to move like that. Because in Spanish, you just don't have to move your tone as much. Um, in the different Mayan languages, you do, which is another reason it's really interesting my students that have the best English pronunciation, and I work in Quiche, so the majority of my students are indigenous students and almost more than half of them grew up speaking in a Mayan language. And so they have the best English pronunciation of any students I work with because they're coming from two language roots, Quiche or Sacapulteco and English. And because they're coming from those two, it's much easier for them because they have more of the muscles developed. So um, that's something that I also use to encourage my students. A lot of times I have indigenous students that feel for different reasons, like uh, their English is bad or that they can't pronounce something. And I always tell them, you know, your, your pronunciation is much better than those students I work with because you have this awesome uh, scaffolding that other students just don't have. Being able to speak a Mayan language gives you so many steps up when you're um, working with learning other languages. So I think that that's a really good way to encourage um, Mayan students to learn English as well. Um, 
and we'll again we'll talk about my thoughts on English as a colonial language towards the end. Okay, so vowels in English. So in Spanish, your vowels move kind of in a circle. A, e, e, o, u. They kind of work in a circle in your mouth. English works that way, but there's all of these sounds in the middle that make it really hard to distinguish between certain sounds. So there's not a lot of movement between a, 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 e. like there's not that much movement in my actual like jaw and mouth. There's movement of the sound, but there's not movement of my muscles necessarily. So that's something that your students have to over articulate. So when I work with students on pronunciation, I usually wear a bright uh, lipstick so that my students can watch my mouth and what I'm doing. And I over exaggerate all of my vowels so that my students can see if a vowel is closed like this, it, or if it's open like aw or o. Oh. You look ridiculous as a teacher, but it's the hands down, it's the best way for your students to see how your face moves to create those sounds. Um, and then eventually they have the muscle memory where they don't have to over articulate and it sounds fine. It's all about your tongue. It is all about the tongue, where the tongue moves, where the tongue falls, where it dies. So um, that's another reason why practicing and having warm-ups is so important. Okay, so <laughs> this is how, this is what I was talking about, how all of these sounds exist kind of in a circle in your mouth. So here are the Spanish vowels. A, E, I, oh, I don't remember where that is. It's somewhere in here. And U, which is up here. That's it. <laughs> All of the rest of these are English vowels. And it makes it really, really challenging for some students. So um, we will go through our vowels really quickly. Okay, so in the IPA, we have some different vowels. And um, all of these vowels are so similar, it's just insane. But we have what's called front, middle, I'm oh, sorry, front, middle, and back vowels. And then we have diphthongs which are combinations of vowels. So in Spanish, you have diphthongs, but the pronunciation of the sounds don't change. Like e, e in seis is still a, like it's still pronounced correctly. You don't change the pronunciation based on its combination with another vowel. Uh, whereas in English, we do. So let's start with our front. Okay, so if you look at these two pictures, the dot between I and the E sound in C and the U sound in food, there's a vowel between that. I used to have a picture of it, but there was no difference <laughs> between it. Like the change is so tiny, you couldn't see the difference. So um, I got rid of that picture and you just have to imagine where the middle of those two dots would be, uh, which is really difficult. So our front vowels are e, e, which happens like right here in your teeth, e, that sound vibrates there, like met and bed. Um, I, like hit and sitting. Um, and someone asked the difference between sheep and ship. So uh, both e and i are front vowels. So we see here we have hit, right here, and we have C. For me, the biggest difference is that that E sound, I stretch out my mouth, E, E. Whereas I, I'm not stretching my mouth as much. And I'm letting like E, E, I can pronounce that with my teeth closed. E, 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 I, I, I is kind of hard to pronounce, like the I in hit, it's kind of hard to pronounce with your teeth closed. So thinking about letting your students, like they need to be able to put a finger between their teeth. E, 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 e. 
that's how I create that difference. So I had someone had asked about those specific sounds. So that's how I create that difference uh, for myself. So then we have our middle vowels, which are the hardest ones. Because the middle vowels are all of our uh sounds. So we have cup and luck. So that uh is actually like here. It's closer to the front of your mouth. And you can feel that vibration. Like if you say uh, uh, it's like closer to the front of your face. Um, and some people have no idea what I'm talking about. And that's totally fine. If you as a teacher or as a person or as a listener or as an English speaker have no idea what I'm talking about, that is totally okay. Some people um, do understand that and that's helpful for them. The people that don't, you can totally ignore what I'm saying because it's not helpful. Um, the best way to practice these sounds is to listen, 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 repeat, repeat, repeat. And also to do some of these exercises that we'll talk about in a minute, but that's the only thing. So then we have a, ah, like cat, and black, and that happens like right in the smack middle of your face. And again, saying ah, ah, this is an American accent. I'm interrupting myself. Um, great, great question in the comments. This is an American ac accent, for sure. I am not British and I'm not going, I, I have an okay British accent, but I'm not going to practice it. Um, but yes, it's, it's an American accent. That's a great question. So we have a ah, cat black, and then we have away. So away versus cup. So cup is a little further away is a little back in your throat. And again, it's really hard to differentiate these sounds. It's hard for you to hear the difference between those two sounds. I can hear them because I've studied this. A lot of people cannot hear them. So don't worry if you can't. Um, and if you pronounce both of those uhs the same, there is no problem. <laughs> There's no problem at all. And then we have cinema, uh, 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 uh. And turn, uh, uh, turn and learn, uh, uh. So those are our middle vowels. And then we have our back vowels, which are arm. And that happens like right here, ah, uh, ah. Uh. You can like feel it fill up that space, ah, uh, ah, uh, arm, father. And then we have hot, ah, uh, ah, uh, hot, rock, ah. Uh. And then we have call, which is a little further forward. So it's actually, so your, your soft palate at the top of your mouth, it curves up and then it curves back down at the back. That call sound is right there where it curves back down at the back of your throat. Um, so I don't know if that helps someone, but that's where it is. Call for, um, put, uh, 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 put, could, and then blue food. So then we have um, all of our diphthongs. So these are just ridiculous and difficult, but we have I, five, and I, ow, now, and out, um, O, go, and home, where, and air, say and eight near so this is a weird sound because it's like e e near and here it's almost like two syllables it's not but it's two separate sounds which is kind of strange e e and then we have oi like boy and join and then we have e like pure and then this includes tourist I pronounce tourist, tourist. There are people from everywhere that pronounce this word differently. Um, a lot of people, even in the, in the US, in Great Britain, in, I don't, I don't know if Australians pronounce it this way, but it's, they pronounce tourist, which I don't, oof, I don't know, that sounds weird to me, but a lot of people pronounce it that way. So if you pronounce it that way, you're not wrong at all. I just choose to say tourist. So those are our vowels. Learning these is hard, teaching these is harder, perfecting them is incredibly difficult. 
Um, I've been speaking Spanish for like eight years now, and I have not perfected the five, <laughs> the five vowels in Spanish. So if it takes you a while to perfect the 20 something vowels in English, um, no one will ever judge you. <laughs> well, let me rephrase. I would never judge you, some others might. Okay, so, but they shouldn't. They should not judge you at all. So now we're going to talk about activities. So typically I use um, stations and we like revolve around and talk about oh, the difference between where um <laughs> that's such a specific question sorry i'm reading the comments uh maybe it, remember that and I'll, I'll come back to it so in our activities so i have three specific ones that i use um or i teach to teachers to um practice pronunciation so we're gonna go through these i'm not gonna read this because we'll talk about them okay so mirror practice Mirror practice is really fun, it's very uncomfortable, and it's very hilarious. So basically what you do is you give your students a mirror or you ask them to bring a mirror from home. And, oh, I actually have one. And you ask them to look at themselves. Let's see if we can, yeah. You ask them to look at themselves and pronounce a word. So like, uh, umbrella, umbrella. Someone asked about that in the comments. But then they have to watch themselves and say, umbrella. And they see, for example, buh, buh. If you ask them to say beach, or wait, let's see. Ban and van. If they say ban, man, and they're looking at a mirror, they can say, oh, you know what? I didn't see my teeth. So I didn't pronounce that fun or pronounce that correctly. So that's a really good way to use mirrors in the classroom. It's also fun if you if you don't have access to mirrors, using a partner and having that person like watch their lips and compare them to like the pictures that I showed earlier and how they can like look at it and say, no, I can't see your teeth or I can't see your tongue or um, something like that. So for the mirror practice, you can use different tactics, but I really like using small texts that the students can practice a specific sound. So I use um, tongue twisters. Can you can a can as a can or can can a can? Um, a proper cup of coffee and a proper coffee cup. And I've, okay, I've given, and like I said, I've given this workshop a million times, so I've practiced these a million times. But this is also a really fun way for your students to practice a specific sound. So like if you're working on P's or K sounds, um, this is a great way for them to practice. So we have, you know, Susie works in a shoe shine shop where she shines, she sits, and where she sits, she shines. This, uh, this one can be a little tricky. Because if you pronounce it slightly differently, it becomes a uh, mala palabra. So be careful with that one. Um, I can think of six thin things and of six thick things too. If you're working with the TH sound, that's a great one. Not these things here, but those things there. Uh, so I have a lot of these and I like to use small, um, I like to use small phrases so that the students can practice, 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 and then look at the mirror and say, Eddie edited it, Eddie edited it, and not um, focus so much on the words. They're just practicing on how they're speaking, right? Okay, so that's my first activity. You as a teacher can do this in your house practicing pronunciation. Like I've had, I've seen so many questions, um, you know, about, how do I pronounce this? How can I practice this? Are there dictionaries? Is there this? Is there that? Do these activities, son. Like, do these in your house. Do these in the mirror. Do these in the bathroom when you're getting ready. Um, these are great ways to help yourself get better. So, um, and also, so for example, for me, I obviously am not Guatemalan. This was a really good way to connect with my students because I asked them, what are some tongue twisters in your language? What are some, these are some tongue twisters in my language. What are some tongue twisters in yours? And we practice, and because when they see me do a terrible job, 
it's hilarious and it is it's so funny being a teacher is equal parts having authority and making a fool of yourself i feel like sometimes so um which is not a bad thing but it's a great way to connect to students that are culturally diverse or different from you so if you are working with um students that are from a cultural minority or from even if you go to the us to teach english or to teach spanish um, this is a great way to interact with students okay minimal pairs are my favorite thing ever i so i'm really technical i'm mathematic i'm um i like facts i like data so minimal pairs are my favorite because you you have two lists and i have tons of these that i can share with you uh if you want me to if you fill out the form i'm happy to share these with you this is okay there's a million reasons why minimal pairs are great one they are so specific they compare two words that have one letter difference that makes a difference in the meaning of the word and these two letters are very close to each other and can create confusion so automatically it's just such a great activity second reason they're easy to find they're easy to create third reason is because um you as the teacher can gather good data from as like reflection of yourself in this activity you can actually watch your student compare b and v and pronounce it incorrectly and you can sit down and work with them show them like show them with your face move your face around so i love minimal pairs it also teaches vocabulary and it's also uh, a really good pair activity so i work with one student sits across from another one one student has a list they read the list if the person if their partner hears a difference thumbs up if they don't hear a difference, thumbs down until they hear a difference. So I've had students say best, 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 20 times before the other kid goes, no, you're still saying best, best. And he goes, fine, best, best. So there's, it's really fun. It's a great way for teams to work together. It practices auditory skills as well as vocal, like speaking skills. So minimal pairs are just the best. They're also fantastic for if you lesson, if you don't manage your time well, or if you miss, like if your students do an activity really fast and you weren't expecting it and you have time at the end of a lesson, that's like every teacher's nightmare, right? Because you don't want your kids to just sit there in silence. Um, you don't want to try to come up with an activity out of nowhere and it fail. Minimal pairs are the best. Just get these little suckers out and your students can practice that for the last 10 minutes of class. So it's great for um, when lesson plans don't go how you think that they'll go or just as like a fun activity. This is a great warm up activity. This is a great. Um, it's just really fun. I love minimal pairs. So there's tons of minimal pairs in the world. You can do them with vowels. You can do them with consonants you can do them with so many different sounds um so these are just great ways to compare sounds and to really dig into the like differentiation in pronunciation also typically um minimal pairs reflect common mistakes that speakers non-native english speakers make so that they can um practice those sounds and not focus on sounds that are like if you pronounce this wrong it doesn't really make that much of a difference so that's why i love minimal pairs okay record yourself this is every student's nightmare girls especially for whatever reason my my female students have had harder time with this than the male students the boys i work with love this but um i i don't know if it's like i'm so embarrassed but Anyways, it's so weird to hear your own voice, right? So find difficult texts to read, practice them, and then listen. So I use longer tongue twisters for this one. So like this one, which I am terrible at this one, but 
Betty Butter bought some butter, but she said this butter's bitter. If I bake this bitter butter, it will make my batter bitter, but a bit of better butter, that would make my batter better. So she bought a bit of butter better than her bitter butter, and she baked it in her batter, and the batter was not bitter, so twas better Betty, better Betty Butter bought a bit of better butter. So you can find these uh, <laughs> in different sounds with different focuses. Um, this one specifically, so it focuses on, you think you're focusing on the B, but what you're actually focusing on are the vowels because this is helping you to differentiate be, ba, 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 be, be, ba. So it's, it's helping you to actually differentiate the vowels as well as practicing your students, making sure that they're saying their B correctly. And then we've also got, yeah, the classic, Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. A peck of pickled peppers, Peter Piper, Peter Piper picked. If Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers, where's the peck of pickled peppers Peter Piper picked? So this is another one um, that you think is helping your students with, um, their P sound, but it's not. It's actually helping them with their vowels. So this is great because you can record it and even as a group, like it can be a group project or a group assignment or not assignment, what am I thinking of? Uh, work, group work in class where each person reads a line and then you have to be like, oh no, you, cre you said that wrong. Or like, oh, your E sounded like eh or something. So they are helping to critique each other. It becomes, you know, group work, teamwork, auditory, visual, um, reading, listening, and speaking. It covers so many bases. Um, so this is a really fun, and there's a million of these, so you can find these everywhere. Um, but they're really good ways to practice those like tricky sounds. Okay, so now to my soap box. If, if some of you may have been at my um, workshop on Wednesday where I talked about how to incorporate anti-racism into the English uh, language classroom. And this is kind of on that same note. So I have a lot of people ask me, how can I truly perfect my pronunciation? And here's the thing, I'm gonna shatter the glass in your head. There is no perfect English pronunciation. I have an accent, you have an accent, the Queen of England has an accent, um, Nelson Mandela had an accent, um, Oprah Winfrey has an accent. Who else speaks English and is culturally diverse? Uh, just so many people. So here's the thing. English is spoken by over 1 billion people on the planet. And out of those 1 billion, only 30% are native speakers, okay? And of those native speakers, only like a third of them are in the Americas or sound like me. The majority of English speakers, fun fact, are in Africa. The majority of English speakers are... Uh, do not pronounce English like me. So for example, I say the word father, right? My father is a veterinarian. And I make that R at the end really hard. Father, farther, um, water. I'm a minority. The majority of English speakers um, do not pronounce English like me. In fact, uh, the majority of English speakers don't pronounce that R at the end. Uh, so in Great Britain, it would be father, uh, father. Another one um, I know so, so we had an, we had a British soccer coach that lived with my family for a while. His name is Keith. Um, and he was from Birmingham, 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 England. And he pronounced T-H as th, th, like an F. So he would be like, I want not three of those. I want three of those. And we would be like, you want them to be free? No, I want three of them. Three. But um, he's a white British English speaker. So who's right? Me or him? Guess what? No one is. 
because English is one of the most dynamic, changing languages in the history of linguistics. English has changed more in the last 100 years than most, most languages have changed over the course of thousands. Um, so like comparing English to Arabic, Arabic has had tons of incredibly interesting variations and changes in its language, but it's very similar to um, Arabic from centuries ago. English is not. I have, this, I have a great presentation, not because of me, because of the information um, on the history of the English language, and it's truly just fascinating because it's just the most ridiculous change between a, of a language in the last 500 years. But that's the thing. If a language changes so much over the course of not a lot of time, then who can have the right pronunciation? I mean, I can tell you, I think that this sounds different, but there's no way I can tell you that it's wrong because pronunciation is, is something that's fluid and it's changing. The way that I pronounce um, sounds is very different than even how my grandmother pronounces sounds in English. So I really, really, really encourage you as teachers to share this with your students. Tell them there are 118 countries around the globe that speak English. There are five continents that have English as an official language. There are over 1 billion English speakers in the world and most of them are in Africa. And use this knowledge to diversify your English teaching. So instead of teaching, instead of showing your kids or having them listen to people like me, have them listen to African-American speakers. Have them watch newscasts from Kenya. Kenyan English is, I think it's gorgeous. Any, honestly, any English spoken in Africa is very attractive sounding. They have perfected like just this really incredible um, dialect of English. Have your students listen to Indian English speakers. Have your students listen to um, Spanglish, Latino English speakers in the US. Have your students listen to people that don't look and sound like me. Because that is going to tell them, one, that I'm a minority of English speakers. Therefore, my opinion, my pronunciation is not the standard. And two, there are so many people that sound like them. There are so many people that make the same pronunciation mistakes as them. So encourage them that they are not alone and that they're not wrong necessarily. Now, if your student specifically wants to work or speak or study in a specific context, then yes, working with them to perfect some different sounds, I think is, is helpful to avoid criticism and bullying. Honestly, adults, even adults can be bullies about pronunciation. Um, so making sure that even if they do want to, even if that's something you're passionate about, teaching them about all of the Englishes in the world. In fact, I think that's my last, right? Englishes. It's so plural. There's so many different forms. Um, it means, though, helping your students to adapt to that context so that they have less communication issues. Um, but so like for the biggest, I think my biggest concern with teachers that only expose their students to people who sound like me and look like me is because they associate race with good English, which is incredibly dangerous because I have heard my students who I talk about anti-racism and racism and we talk about colorism and we talk about the colonial aspect of English and Spanish and all of these things. We talk about this all the time and they will hear an African-American speaker and say, oh, their English is terrible. And I have to be like, hold on. One, that's racist. Two, they have a very different dialect of English. In fact, most linguists study African-American English as its own language because it's a combination of multiple different dialects, languages, pronunciations, grammar structures, it's just different. And um, so you have to prepare your students to not associate my English with my race because 
English changes based on race, location, history, the history of colonization. Um, I mean, that's why African-American English is so different. They spent all of their time developing English as slaves, essentially. So, or in, as enslaved people, excuse me. So it's really important to clarify that with students in my personal opinion. Um, and then, so diversify it. In class, find videos, YouTube videos, movies. Use Black History Month as the perfect time to expose your students to all the different kinds of, all the different sounding Black English. So there's Black English Africa. Black, there's Black English from West Africa, East Africa, Central Africa, South Africa. I mean, Africa is this huge continent with millions of different cultures and subcultures. So you can't just say Africa. But um, compare that. Have your students listen to people like me, that's fine. But compare it to different kinds of Englishes because even though my job requires me to teach primarily American English, I. I made my students watch a grammar tutorial on YouTube that was created by an Eng by an Indian English teacher. And I loved it. It was the only video I could find that explained clauses the way I wanted to. And my students really, they had some awesome feedback. They were like, it was kind of hard, but I listened to it and it really helped me understand that there are different English speakers. So just, I mean, your students are gonna enjoy it. And I'm also seeing in the comments that there are so many different, um, pronunciations even in the United States. So I'm from the South. I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee. I'm a Southerner through and through. I had to lose my accent when I started teaching English. And it's funny because when I call my um, when I call my mom or my grandmother, especially my grandmother because she has a thicker accent, um, when I get off the phone, my fiance is like, what happened to you? Your English is so weird now. So I mean, English is so diverse, even amongst people that do look like me. So I think that that's really important. And um, I think that's where I'll end. And so I'm ready for questions uh, whenever you're ready, Jocelyn and Lisa. Thank you so much, Savannah, for such a great conference and all the information that you shared with us. And yeah, we have some questions for you. The first one is, is there a specific reason to be harder for us to have a better pronunciation than children? Is there, sorry, can you repeat it? I, can, I can't hear you very well. Okay, don't worry. Is there a specific reason to be harder for us to have a better pronunciation than children? and yes. So the thing is, children will learn it faster um, just because their brains develop at like twice, three times, four times the speed of adults. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily being harder on adults versus children, but I think it's setting, it's setting um, realistic expectations for adults, making sure that they're aware that this does take time that your muscles are so, um, they are so stuck where they are now. So developing new ones, uh, new muscles and new connections to create these new sounds can be really challenging. So it's not so much to be harder on them as much as it is to set those expectations and go from there. Okay. Uh, another question. What is the best way to practice pronunciation? Oh, goodness. So, my, I'm trying to think of how my pronunciation in Spanish improved. So, honestly, the thing that helped me the most, and again, this is totally my opinion and how it worked best for me, was recording myself and listening because I have, I'm very auditory in how I learn. So I can hear good Spanish. Like I can hear someone speak Spanish and say, that sounds good, or that's a native speaker or whatever. So I can, I can tell because that's what I, I mean, I study this and I'm, I'm auditory in how I think and learn. So for me, it was recording myself, listening 
and constantly, you know, reflecting and having a really, uh, you know, self-conscious learning experience. Whereas I know for other people, it's listening to other people speak. Um, but it, it depends on how you learn. If you're mathematic, musical, uh, I would say that listening to others is a great way. If you're not, if you're more auto, if you're more visual, um, watch people like watch videos of people working on pronunciation because you'll see their mouths move. And I'll say I am terrible at speaking on the phone in Spanish because I can't see people's mouths. So that's all that is like half of the battle learning a language and learning pronunciation. So I would say practicing pronunciation is a mixture of a lot of different things. You have to know yourself as a learner and as a teacher and do what's best for you. But the these activities that I've shared do them as a teacher do them like you will improve by doing exercises like this just like your students that's my advice okay and our last question is there a web a web page to practice phonics yes someone asked that question okay so here oh you know what okay i have time i'm gonna see let's see what happens if i do this can I open this? Oh, great. I'm just going to share it. Okay. So here I'm sharing with you this website, which is by Cambridge. So I think it's British. I can't remember. But when you come here, you can click on the sound and it comes up with this. I don't know if you guys can see that. Gold. And it pronounces the sound. Eggs. Egg. And it pronounces the actual sound so that you can hear it. There's also this one. Let's see if that is. Yeah. This one's cool too because you can click on it and it tells you like the actual sound. And like some of these sounds don't exist in English and some of them don't exist in Spanish, but that's a really easy, that's a fun website to go and kind of work through some different sounds, especially if you're having issues with a word, Google the IPA of that word, and then you can come here and like really work on the sound that you're having issues with. So that's, uh, that's a cool little resource. But those are the two resources that I have used. Other than that, I'm not super aware of um, another like website, but I hope that that's helpful at least. And then I have a couple of different um, worksheets and games. I've found more information than this and I have it, it's just on my, it's like things that I've, files that I have. Um, and then here, I'll type this into the chat. Um, I can't. Yeah. So if you would like this information and please, can you give me feedback? Um, please fill out this um, encuesta, como se llama? Survey. <laughs> Um, so, and I, I, I mean, we have a time for one more question if, if we want. Okay. One last question would be, how can I learn to pronounce well English language if it's not my mother tongue? <sighs> yeah, um, that's super tough because... <laughs> It's just time. And it's honestly, it's being patient with yourself. It's understanding that you're learning. It's understanding that you're teaching. And it's understanding that you're trying to better yourself by learning another language. Um, so honestly, so much of it is patience. Be patient with yourself. Like, don't, um, don't be so hard on yourself for not sounding perfect. And then also, you know, expand the people you're listening to. Listen to English speakers who don't sound like you and don't sound like me so that you can start to, you know, you're not alone. 
you're not the only one. But if you are specifically looking to practice or to better your American or British or Irish English, it just requires, you know, reading, listening, uh, recording yourself and speaking it back or having a, um, or recording yourself and playing it back or speaking with other, um, or sending that to a native speaker of that specific dialect or language. So, but it, it's just be patient with yourself. Be patient and know that you're, there are so many English speakers all over the world that sound so different. Um, so don't get discouraged, I think would be my advice. Thank you so much, Savannah, for answering all these questions. Okay, and for our dear audience, uh, the rest of the questions are going to be answered. And the answers are going to be uh, on the fan page of Facebook, Section Video, but don't worry, this is going to be um, on that page, okay? Don't worry. So now, for the attendance form, uh, th this is going to be shared right now in the chat in YouTube, so you can fill it in. So remember, you should map all your hours during the conferences you attend. For example, this and others that you attend before. And also we have another conference at five. So please join us. And thank you so much to all the audience. And until now, we have 10 minutes to fill uh, the form in, please, the attendance form. Thank you so much for uh, being here with us. Savannah, thank you so much. And thank you. Has, yes, thank you. This has been all for now in this conference. And please um, join us um, to the next conference at five and uh, subscribe to our channel, Idioma Sotaque and TPS Conference, to stay tuned on all the posts that we have coming, okay? Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Jocelyn.